Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you ever so much for the invitation to speak today. Um, I'm zooming in from Australia, where I've recently started a new job. Um, so I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners and custodians of the land from which I'm speaking, the Turbal and Jegera peoples. Um, to be blunt about it, the land from which I'm speaking was colonized by Europeans, their agricultural plants, and their systems of farming. Colonization is a theme of the paper today, because colonization and the colonial mindset were in many ways a key context for agricultural development in the early 20th century. That's a theme that we'll come back to later. I'm uh, keenly aware that my talk stands between you and lunch, so I will be bold, provocative, polemical, and brief. To that end, and to reflect the not quite business as usual for historians, um, I've jazzed up the title a little bit. Roland Biffin, how one man got muddled up about Mendel and failed to change the face of British agriculture in the ways he wanted. The new job, I'm very excited about it. Um, it's working for the Australian Research Council's Centre of Excellence for Plant Success in Nature and Agriculture, based at the University of Queensland here in Brisbane. So, plant success. In Britain, in the early 20th century, if one asked the average Daily Mail reader, which are the successful plants and what makes them successful, it would not be surprising to hear them say, Mendelian plants, not even genetic plants, but Mendelian plants. This was a widely spread belief in the Mail, the Times, as well as many other places, including the Royal Agricultural and Horticultural Societies. Mendelum, Mendelism was, for many people, the route to producing successful agricultural plants. The bulk of this paper is devoted to looking at how successful those plants were and what sort of role Mendelism played in their success. The paper is a work of historical revisionism about the story of the first generation of genetically modified plants. So we'll be looking at the mythology, let's say, of Mendelian success in producing plants. Then I'll offer some critical analysis that pushes back against that story of Mendelian success. And finally, I'll try to draw out some hand wavy lessons that we might derive from this more accurate history and its analysis. So, speaking of history, uh, this is possibly one of the most famous quotes from one of the most famous books in the English language. History is everywhere about us in our society. Everybody surely knows that those who don't study history are doomed to repeat it mistakes and failures. To paraphrase Nietzsche's analysis in his book, The Uses and Abuses of History, too much respect for history stolifies us and traps us. It prompts us in our efforts, like Joyce, to escape. But on the other hand, too little respect for history and we act like reckless drunks. Here, what I hope to offer you is just the right amount of history, a Goldilocks level, enough to help us to avoid some pitfalls and problems, but not so much that we become trapped in the veneration of heroes. So let's begin with a well-worn story. Then I'll tell you everything that's wrong with that story before concluding by looking at the benefits, some of the benefits of working with more accurate stories. These are our main characters. From left to right, Reginald Punnett, William Bateson, and Roland Biffin. In a thumbnail sketch, here's the widely known story. Mendel's work is rediscovered at the turn of the century. Bateson brings Mendel's ideas to Britain. Here in Britain, Bateson teaches those ideas to Biffin at the School of Agriculture at Cambridge University. Biffin shows that several agriculturally significant crop traits are inherited in a Mendelian fashion. And he proves this to be the case with the release of a disease-resistant variety called Little Joss in around 1908, 
and a bread making variety called Yeoman in around 1912. These varieties are self evidently useful and they come to inhabit three quarters of the country's acreage by the 1920s. Everyone is very happy with these developments. Biffin is awarded the Royal Society's Darwin Medal and a knighthood to become Sir Professor Roland Biffin. And the rest, as they say, is history. Uh, this story was common in the period and it has endured ever since. Here you can see Bateson for telling the story and looking forward to a time when plant breeders will be as precise as chemists in their work. And here you can see Noel Kingsley looking back on that story in 2010 with the claim that Mendelism takes a lot of the effort out of plant breeding. This is Reginald Punnett's version of that story. Note how before Mendelism, there's a great deal of waste, but after Mendelism, the breeder will work synthetically to build up the plants that he requires. This is a pictorial representation of that same idea. Mendelism gives the plant breeder a way of tracking characteristics and traits as they are inherited and passed on from parents to offspring in ways which can be deterministically manipulated. This is Biffin describing the work himself and claiming that disease resistance forms exactly the sort of character pair that Mendel himself might have wished for. And this gloriously punny yet deeply misguided article from the Daily Mail underscores the popularity of his belief in the period. This was a cause celebrated by figures ranging from David Lloyd George to HRH, the Prince of Wales. It's worth pointing out as an aside that a corner, meaning a monopoly, is probably a reference to the 1909 D.W. Griffith film, A Corner of Wheat. Less famous than The Birth of a Nation, these sorts of connections still point out the deep links between agriculture, nation, and indeed empire building. This quote is taken from Roland Biffin's obituary, written by Biffin's star student, Frank Engeldow, who went on to succeed Biffin as chair of agricultural science at Cambridge University, and then determine agricultural policy in the empire the next two decades of colonial office. Note once again, these ideas of orderly synthesis, displacing mysticism and guesswork. And note once again, this idea that Biffin's work goes on to dominate plant breeding in all countries. However, in this very same obituary, we get the first inkling that something might be wrong with this story. Engeldow can barely bring himself to call Biffin a scientist. With Biffin, he says, it was the eye of an artist. And that artistic eye led Biffin through sheer admiration of the beautiful era of wheat to using the wrong types of plants. So much for the story of Mendelism saving us from waste in plant breeding. And the news just gets worse from there. Um, it turns out that Biffin was a heterox, heterodox Mendelian at best. At worst, it's possible he doesn't really understand Mendelian theory. There are two pieces of evidence that I want to mention here. So um, it turns out that disease resistance does not form the sharply differentiated pair of characters that Mendel might have hoped for. And a closer reconstruction of Biffin's big 1905 paper shows that, in fact, the relationship is something more like co-dominance, a modification to simple dominance relations between traits that Bateson had already suggested by this point. And indeed, Bateson spent some time grousing behind the scenes to the Royal Society's secretary, William Bate Hardy, that Biffin was a practical man who didn't really deserve the plaudits of a scientific reward, 
much less one bearing Darwin's name, and previously awarded to big hitters like August Weismann and Hugo de Vries. So it seems that where Biffin's actual expertise lies is in plant breeding. In fact, he marries into a famous plant breeding family and wins several awards with his wife, Mary Hemus, from the Royal Horticultural Society. Biffin's life's big work, published posthumously, is a work of fancy, a hobbyist's book on the auricula, the florist's flower. So Biffin seems to be using Mendelism as a kind of fig leaf of respectability to cover his actual plant breeding skills and their use as the basis for his work. So bad Mendelian, good plant breeder. It turns out he was also terrible agriculturalist. He had a very public fight with the farmers of the London Farmers Club after he tried to convince them to grow wheat for bread making purposes rather than chicken feed. Indeed, while Biffin's varieties were successful, it was not for the reasons he intended or because of the traits he claimed to have used Mendelism to engineer into them. His disease resistant variety was resistant to a disease that hardly bothered farmers. Instead, they fit little Joss into patterns of extensive farming using less favorable land to produce chicken feed or biscuits during the war. And when farmers had more money and access to artificial fertilizers, yeoman was not used to bake the English loaf of bread that Biffin saw as the salvation of British farming. And instead, the variety was used intensively with extra fertilizer to make bulk chicken feed production after the war. Yeoman was the beginning of a farming pattern that increasingly saw arable crops used for animal feed. But it gets worse. Biffin's work also represents various forms of colonialism. Metaphorically, he is part of a movement that sought to colonize plant breeding by genetics, geneticists, and colonize agriculture by scientists. That is to say, Biffin was part of a movement that sought to assert that plant breeding and agriculture properly conceived should be the domain of expertise of scientists and specifically Mendelians and then geneticists. This is an act of takeover in which a particular territory is inhabited by new entrants, the new class of scientific experts in the 20th century. Men like Frank Engeldau, who set agricultural policy on scientific basis. At the same time, the previous experts, plant breeders, naturalists, hybridists, like the men Mendel drew inspiration from, were denigrated as tradition-bound dogs. More literally, Biffin was part of a movement to recolonize the English countryside after recession and depopulation with a new generation of high quality bread wheat. The All English Loaf Campaign, as it was called in its regular appearances in the Daily Mail. Uh, that campaign was a failure and the All English Loaf didn't appear until the 1950s when it was made possible not by new varieties, but by new milling techniques. And finally, on this theme of colonialism, Biffin was quite directly involved, as when in the 1930s, he was summoned to give expert advice to the colonial government of Kenya. And once again, his advice was essentially to stimulate a new wheat growing economy through scientific research. And, once again, the advice was spurned by the settler agriculturalists on the ground who were much more interested in the intensive plantation crops, which they saw as the way to higher profits. So Mephin was probably a bad Mendelian and more of a plant breeder really, as well as being a bad agriculturalist and part of a movement which sought to colonize these fields of expertise agriculture and plant breeding with new scientific thought and colonized Britain and the empire 
with new types of plants. What can we do? What does this all mean? Um, and this is where the hand waving starts. Although I think it's right and proper that on these sorts of occasions, we should, as historians, be more thoughtful about these lessons from history. So the first thing to do is give Biffin his due. Without Biffin, it is unlikely that we would be celebrating Mendel in the way we are today. He really did stand on Mendel's shoulders, see a little further in terms of thinking about how to use Mendel's work, even if his own plans and schemes were largely unsuccessful or his own work was probably mistaken. And it's unlikely that genetics would have been as successful as it has been in taking over biological research without this first quick and seemingly successful application. Lastly, Biffin spearheaded a movement towards publicly funded plant breeding, which dominated British agriculture, generally for the better rather than for the worse, right up until the 1980s. Biffin was part of the reason why there isn't and hasn't ever been an equivalent to the American companies like Monsanto or Pioneer, which came to dominate seed production in ways which we might argue are unhealthy in the British context. What else can we learn from Biffin's story? Biffin's story spells out that there is no simple route to success. What one needs is people and time and money and luck and skill. We should be suspicious of claims of easy scientific victory. I'm looking at you, CRISPR. Mostly when Biffin was promoting the importance of science, it was so he could secure part of the newly available funding created by David Lloyd George's People's Budget. That money was needed for staff and resources like land. And despite both a great deal of luck and skill and resources, Biffin's new varieties took about as long to produce as the pre-Mendelian varieties, about 10 years, give or take. And that is roughly how long it still takes to produce a new variety today. So Biffin's story is a healthy tonic to the view that science progresses through singular, spectacular achievement. Another key lesson that we should, that we might take from Biffin's story is that we should avoid repeating the mistakes of colonizing or indeed recolonizing agriculture. I'm looking at you, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, but more generally as a development vision also seen during the Green Revolution that suggests one size fits all genetic varieties are the only way to address agricultural problems. The danger is that such systems of development might brute force GMOs into being a solution with overblown claims about the science and a lack of sensitivity to the agricultural contexts into which they are inserted. What's needed is taking agriculturalists, farmers seriously, being aware of different types of agriculture and agricultural contexts. This is an alternative view to the thesis that science develops in isolation from society. Interestingly, in his more reflective and less triumphant moments, this is something that Bates knew. Every trend does indeed contain the seeds of its own counter trend. So Bateson says that fancying is something which great many people in Britain are involved in, and scientific naturalists should have more sympathy with that work than has commonly occurred. If the scientific world had kept in touch with the operations of the fancy, much nonsense which has passed into scientific orthodoxy would never have been written. Finally, Biffin's story shows that oftentimes life is about making a choice about the sort of world we want and then attempting to force that vision into existence. Biffin and farmers made their choices and were more or less successful. The intensive agriculture we have today 
probably owes more to those early 20th century farmers' economic choices than the usual stories of scientific triumph or domination would suggest. One thing Biffin was incredibly successful at was propagandizing the idea that science was the royal route to better crops. That vision has certainly stuck, and one suspects it was largely due to Biffin's dogged and stubborn desire to will it into existence, especially because the evidence suggests that science was not as important to agricultural development and Biffin's new varieties as he and other scientific boosters would have us believe. So, just briefly, in conclusion, I would like to say, if you hear that genetic modification is centuries old, goes back to a monk in his garden, breeding peas and by implication that genetic modification is tried and true, or that the application of Mendelian thought to plant breeding and ultimately to agriculture was mundane and routine, I hope this talk has given enough cause you to pause for thought and think, well, not quite. There's actually something more interesting happening here. In many ways, the course of action was decided upon and made to work. Let's celebrate and appreciate that work, but also be critical of it. Thank you ever so much.